Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Hello, listeners. Thank you for joining us. The topic we'll be discussing shortly is about end of life conversations and their importance. I'm hoping that you'll agree this is something you need to be aware of and you'll stick around. However, I'm certain there will be others that will be thinking, oh, I don't need to listen to this. I don't need this yet. Please, before you go, I would love you to stick around just a little bit longer to hear what my guest, Jonathan Fleece, has to say about his company, Empath Health, one of the country's largest not-for-profit health systems delivering non-acute care services in the U.S. And there is a little bit of a link to a newly released film called Suncoast, and We'll go into that, so stick around. Jonathan is the empath president, as I've mentioned, and CEO, and I'm looking forward to discussing how this organization and the unique connection came about, as this levels uh, many areas that somebody going through grief, anticipatory grief, is likely to experience and just why having an end-of-life conversation with our loved ones is so very important. Welcome, Jonathan, to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. Thank you so much, Anne, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share our wisdom and experience around this this very important topic of, of grief. It's great to be here. Oh, I'm looking forward to what nuggets And what rabbit holes, as I like to say, we're we're likely to fall around. Now, this is indeed a topic that's near near and dear to my own heart on a number of levels. As I experienced this going through the death of my, my parents, so I can relate to what it is we're going to be talking about. Jonathan, I'm I'm always curious to know what brought you to empath health what brought you into this line of work well and it was grief to be very transparent and to open up the conversation a bit my wife and i lost our first daughter in the year 2000 uh, to a heart defect when she was born she was an infant and uh although 20 plus years ago now, I remember it like yesterday, holding my infant daughter in my arms and seeing uh, a light and a a life that was taken way too soon. And it was through that grief journey and ultimately the healing journey that led my life work to end of life care and to now leading the organization Uh, that works around end-of-life care and grief every day. I I made a commitment to our daughter, Katie, when she died, uh, that her very, very short life would have purpose and meaning, and and that's how I ended up uh, committing my life's work to leading this organization. I love that. Katie gave you your life's work, and ultimately it gave her short life purpose and meaning. Oh, I love that. Thank you. And I'm so sorry that that is your story. And when you hear and talk to many people that are willing to open up, there is a story of how they got to where they are today, isn't it? We're a community uh, here on this, this planet we call Earth. 
And we, we all know sometimes it's easy to, to wish it away or, or in some cases deny it, but we all know that grief is, is going to face us or is facing some of your listeners as they are, are hearing our, our words today. Mm -hmm. And, and you're right. I think knowing that we have each other as, as humanity and, certainly organizations that specialize in grief care. It's, it's frankly what helped me through my darkest days uh, participating in, in counseling and grief programs. Yeah. And there's something healing about giving back, isn't there? As you mentioned. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm sure the psychologists in, who may be listening can give us more insight as to why giving back and uh, helping and supporting others can actually help us in our own grief. But it, it is true. And I've heard that for, from so many of my guests. Absolutely. And, you know, another, I think, element of grief that that I experience and that we certainly hear often in our grief service programs that Impact Health provide is that those experiencing grief want others to be empathetic. They want others to, to have an appreciation and an understanding of, of the journey. So oftentimes that's how we, who have also gone through grief, can walk alongside others that are perhaps at a different um, place in their, their healing journey because uh, losing Katie 20 plus years ago, while I certainly still shed tears, mm -hmm. that loss and that pain and that sorrow is certainly not as as uh, deep and as raw and as as gut wrenching as it was 20 plus years ago. And and I think what that hopefully enables me to do as both a leader and oftentimes you know talking to audiences like I am today, it can provide just a little bit of nugget of hope that for those that are in a very, very dark place and can't even imagine climbing out of, of sadness and sorrow to hear that others have and can, can give that, that element of hope. Absolutely. And I think that's what people need to hear that you can, you're not going to remain in that raw grief, as you mentioned, there are ways that, it will soften. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to remember the person and shed a tear every now and again at the what ifs, what would that life have been like? Because that in itself is a grief, isn't it? The, the life that didn't get to evolve. Absolutely. Yeah. Grief is, is very much multidimensional. And when we lose a loved one at any stage of life, they're they're truly both segments. I mean, they're many segments, but they're they're the segment of the person that has died, and then knowing that that person has lost and won't live um, to see a birthday or to see a wedding or an anniversary or graduation. And there's there's that element of grief, but then of course there's the grief of those left behind and those that are still suffering. Yeah. over the loss. And, and I think understanding the different segments of grief can be very helpful to people so that they can um, learn to, I think, identify the different segments and, and perhaps work through each segment um, as, as that element of grief is, is posing itself. Absolutely. Uh, very true. Just sort of presencing that there are many uh, levels uh, and experiences. The grief isn't just about the loss of the person, but it encompasses so much more. Why do you feel it's important that people have these conversations with with their loved ones? What's the purpose of it, Jonathan? So a lot of the answer to that, Anne, depends on on where families where people are in a particular grief journey. So uh, we could talk about a lot of different examples. And if any speak to you, and as you mentioned earlier, I'm certainly sorry for your 
loss of your parents and some of the grief um, journeys that you've walked on as well. I think if we look at grief in different ways, there is that anticipatory grief that you mentioned earlier. And I think that is a very, very unrecognized element of grief because it's it's awareness and and I think knowledge that there is going to be a loss in the future. Um, oftentimes patients and families don't know exactly when that day is coming, but they know it is coming. And acknowledging that there is the anticipatory grief phase is mm -hmm. very, very important. And as we work with families and patients during anticipatory grief, a lot of that surrounds um, opening conversations and asking a lot of questions with patients and families. You know, do you have unresolved conflict? Do you have life experiences that that you want to ensure happen before you die? Um, do you feel prepared? And that word prepared is is very is very important because there can be the the mental preparation, there can be the spiritual preparation if if an individual is spiritual or religious. Yeah. Um, this can be overlooked. There's often a lot of of logistical things. Have funeral arrangements been made? You know, who are uh, powers of attorney and health care decision uh, surrogate? Um, this, how are those kind of decisions going to be made? And who are you going to entrust? to make some of those decisions if a patient can't do that at the end of life on their own. Um, so I think understanding that anticipatory grief is, is super important. I don't know how further you'd like to expand upon that because I think that's very different than, than after a death and how people then have to um, work through and face grief after death. It's, it's I think important to understand the difference. Absolutely. I wanted to raise the question and we'll go into it with regards to the film and how that dealt with it. So I'm I'm going to just stay on some of the points that you've raised. Is there unresolved differences? What does the person want? Do they want heroic end of life, life saving a resuscitation or taking a palliative or chemotherapy to, you know, the nth degree? How do they want to remain comfortable, i.e. palliative care? And when you are in that anticipatory grief, is not a time, is it, to be uh, making all these decisions because it's almost like your decision-making capacities have gone online, gone offline. So all these questions, as you mentioned, are probably being faced by the person, say, in your organization whose loved one is in care, and the staff are asking, whether it's the chaplain, whether it's the the nurse, whether it's the doctors, all these questions are going to be there. And underlying, as you said, is the knowing that that person will die. The additional stress is you just don't know when. And that can really as exacerbate the anticipatory grief as well, can't it? Yes, absolutely. And I think it's also very healthy and very um, normal that even though we certainly encourage conversation around end of life as as soon as families and people are willing to have it i mean certainly i think many experts and advisors will will suggest that it's best for all of us to put some of these plans together before there's even a diagnosis of end of life. You know, so you can truly, as you mentioned earlier, and think through these these hard and tough questions when the mind is clear and when there isn't a crisis or there isn't a lot of emotional fear uh, around it. But but regardless how much planning goes into end of life, and frankly, uh, even when it has to occur closer to the end of life because perhaps people have put it off or it's just been too difficult. 
I also think it's it's very natural and and um, and common to recognize that decisions can be changed, decisions can be made in the moment, mm-hmm. uh, events and and feelings as end of life progresses and as as people know that that the true end is coming. Sometimes people see things differently than maybe when they had made their original plans. And I think that's all very, very understandable. So I think people can certainly appreciate that while you can make plans, it's also okay to deviate from those plans. I think it's the underlying importance, though, of just having conversation and being open about it. I think that's the thrust of all of this. Yeah, because I've been at the other end of it helping and supporting families who are in total disagreement about what what it should be one wants this the other's going no you know mom or dad or or the person would have wanted this and that in itself can create divides is this something that empath help health can support these families in in navigating those heightened anxiety emotions i mean they're coming from an amazing place at wanting to do what's best for their their person isn't it yes uh, we do see lots of family dynamics in end of life care and the work that we do and it's one of i think the 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 most important basis for the conversation you and i had a few moments ago of of the importance of of designating at least one, oftentimes it can be two, depending upon the dynamics between those two people, but at least one healthcare surrogate, power of attorney type individuals that that when the patient or the loved one is, is incapacitated or has sort of gone beyond a point of making um, the best decisions for themselves, they have entrusted one person. But to your point, even though that can happen, there can always be family dynamics and disagreements over what did the patient want? What does that surrogate who the patient entrusted to, um, for decision making want? And, and I think having it at least defined as much as families can do in advance can really help organizations like Empath that provide end-of-life care ensure that we're carrying out the wishes and the desires and the will of the patient. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, while we are here to support the entire family, we're here to support the loved ones and help them too, our ultimate obligation is always to the patient. And our commitment is to making sure that we're carrying out the treatment plan and the end of life plan that is really what that patient or individual wants. I liked how you said that our first is for the patient we care for. Absolutely. I love that. And helping to navigate the family just adds another additional level to the work that you do to help that person transition for sure what else goes on at empath health because it's a pretty big organization let's kind of (laughs) dip into that for a moment shall we well that's a wonderful question and perhaps we can even tell a little bit of the history of of end of life care and hospice so modern day hospice was founded by a woman today referred to as dame cicely saunders out of uh, england uh, suburb of, of the London uh, metropolitan area. And she's now referred to as Dame because uh, the late Queen Elizabeth uh, uh, appointed her a Dame during her life for being such an incredible human being. And it's really all rooted in a love story. Uh, Cicely Saunders fell in love uh, with a, a, a Jewish escapee of, of the Nazi occupied areas of Europe. Uh, and had moved and escaped to England, and they fell in love. And unfortunately, he um, protracted cancer, 
and she was a nurse and cared for him during his cancer journey and then ultimately ended life and death. And uh, Cicely Saunders watched and experienced a loved one die a very, very uncomfortable, um, painful, miserable death experience. And she committed her life's work to doing more for humanity and, and creating the hospice movement and mission to really um, surround people with care, comfort, and compassion. So what's really connected to the Dame Cicely Saunders movement is, is Empath Health's uh, roots. We are now soon to be seven not-for-profit hospice organizations across the state of Florida. Um, we will be bringing on two more over on the east coast of Florida, the Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale area, that when we all come together as, as these seven not-for-profit hospice organizations, we will care for 5,000 people a day under our hospice end-of-life programs. And these are traditionally the legacy not-for-profit hospices across the United States. So when Dame Cicely Saunders inspired hospice to expand across the world, there were very, very early hospice programs in the United States, the first rooted out of Connecticut, and then actually Florida was a very early state to sort of adopt the hospice movement. So okay. many of our hospices, Suncoast Hospice is one, Tidewell Hospice, the Trustbridge Hospice Organization that's soon joining we have been providing hospice care services in some cases for 45 plus years in our, in our community. But over those 45 years of providing end of life care, we continue to see more and more need to approaching the end of life in a similar kind of hospice way that we call interdisciplinary approach, looking at the whole person much yeah. sooner than than the death and dying phase. So we now have senior care programs we, that include adult day programs and community services and uh, geriatric medicine type uh, programs that can help seniors that are that are years away from from hospice or end of life. But it's still taking that holistic interdisciplinary approach. We have home based care uh, programs that are around rehabilitation and helping people after stroke or heart attack or perhaps a surgery that is 100% focused on, on re rehabbing them and, and bringing them back to full life. In fact, that's how we came up with our mission statement of providing extraordinary full life care for all. This notion of full life is really what we're about. And, and regardless now, whether it's a hospice patient that is at the end of life, or it's a, a post-stroke patient that is rehabilitating uh, their, their, their mind, body, and spirit after, after a stroke, we're all about giving people that full life up until the last breath. But it can be years before the end of life that, um, that we feel that this, this mission and movement that Dame Cicely Saunders inspired can be can be really applied to an interdisciplinary holistic approach to care. Wow, thank you for giving us that background. Yes, I was very aware of Dame Cicely. I too wanted to become a palliative care nurse, but wow. I took a side, side journey. I decided to come to Canada and that's a whole other story. But Wow. Um, Did you get to meet Dame Cicely Saunders, Anne, at any point? Um, no. I nursed on the Florence Nightingale. Wow. Um, the yes. biggest ones. Yes. Not neat cubicles of today. Yes. Uh, that was that was a long time ago. But anyway, it was that notion of seeing patients on these wards being surrounded by so many people, the nurses, that they silently slipped away. And to me as a young nurse, that didn't seem humane. Where was our humanity in somebody sitting with that person? Of course, going into palliative care, understanding a little better, there's a whole other podcast we could do just on that 
What I love about what you said there is you treat the person as a whole person. What a novel concept. Yes. Yes, and that is the fabric and the foundation of the hospice in the life movement that Dame Cicely Saunders created. So when we look at care, regardless whether it's on our home team for, for home health, whether it's one of our uh, senior programs and we're pulling them into some of our adult day programs and some of our socialization programs that we have to help seniors not you know have to face isolation and, and clinical depression that often can result at end of life for being um, disconnected and feeling isolated, whether it's, it's, it is true hospice end of life care, we're always looking at the whole person and what are the needs of the whole person? Because there can be spiritual needs, there can be physical needs, there can be psychosocial needs, there can be um, basic uh, social determinant type needs, uh, having basic nutrition transportation. So we really look at all of those factors so that we can help people when they need us the most and and look at the holistic approach to giving them a full life. That is beautiful. And thank you for bringing in the um, the rehabilitation part of it, because whenever there's been a stroke or a change in a person's lifestyle, there's grief there, isn't there? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we can use stroke as an example. Um, certainly medicine has made uh, tremendous advances in treating strokes, especially um, intervention that can occur, you know, as soon as, cl- as, soon as, as the event has occurred is certainly when you can get your greatest outcomes. But but regardless of, of the circumstance, um, and, and certainly there can be very significant strokes that, that even intervention can't really 100% rehabilitate, whatever is, is the more permanent repercussion of a stroke, there is that element of loss. You know, is it a speech impediment? Is it a mobility impediment? Is it a cognitive impediment? And, and to your point, I think that's a great conversation around another subset of grief. It's yeah. not always grief at the at the epic level of losing a person. It, it can be very departmentalized and and it can be segmented along the way. In fact, we talk about that a lot when there is a a terminal diagnosis or when there are a lot of maybe uh, multiple chronic diseases or co- co- what we call co- comorbidity um, circumstances where the patient is is truly losing something special along the way. And each loss is significant and, and really can be independent of the whole, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's it's yeah, important absolutely. to recognize that and to help people along those those small or more, um, I think, finite losses, recognizing there will ultimately be a bigger loss at the end. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up because, yes, people aren't aware. There's, wherever there's a change in circumstances, there is an element of grief lurking there. And when you mention the psychosocial, the spiritual, the physical, the mental and emotional, all, all those all those sort of areas, that is how I like to look at grief as a whole because it 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 can be pervasive. It affects all these areas. And I think people just think it's an emotional thing, but it affects all these, and that is what makes grief a little trickier to navigate. Would you, what are your thoughts there? We see that all the time. Um, there is a very, I think, significant multidimensional conversation to have around grief. And it can be what seems to be more apparent to people. So certainly if, if, if they're grieving over a loss or it's anticipatory grief and and people 
cry, we'll use that as an example. Well, well, that's obvious to someone. Well, I'm grieving and that solicits crying. But what can be very subtle that oftentimes people are not aware of is the physical toll that grief can, can have on, on the body. So grief can lead to, to exhaustion and, and being very, very tired. Grief can lead to losing sort of that management of emotion. So, you know, the phrase short fuse or, or you reach the end of your rope and anger management type um, challenges can surface. And that certainly can be, can be a signal. And, and then clinical depression, you know, and that can be hard sometimes to recognize, but, you know, we, we see signs that that can be the case where people, you know, once were motivated um, and are now sleeping more than they're wanting to get out of bed. And, and all of those can be very, very significant um, signs of unresolved grief. Yeah. yeah. And those are the moments where if it's been going on for a little longer than a few months, perhaps, it's definitely time to seek help from somebody from your organization. Um, because I would imagine, do you support people after the, the client or the patient has, uh, transitioned has died yes we do so we help people during the anticipatory grief grief phase um leading up to to an event and then we work with families loved ones that are connected to death and to a loss for oftentimes years after um years after the death okay i'll never forget a story i was um leaving one of our inpatient uh, care centers for for hospice care and it was uh, an evening and i was walking out of the care center and we have memory gardens and memory sidewalks for loved ones where families can make a donation to our foundation and then get a brick to put into a a sidewalk garden area with their their loved one's name and if they wanted to certainly share you know, a message, we can have all that engraved on the brick. And I was walking out of the care center and I looked over and there was a young woman weeping over, over one of the bricks. Mm. And of course I walked over and, and asked if, if I could help in any way. And, um, and she opened up and said that this was the first time she had been to our care center in three years since her father had died there and she continued to share that life had been very hard for her over those three years and that she had essentially buried the reality and I think the realization that her father had died. And um, a few things I think had opened that up for her and she was inspired or called to to want to go to the place where he died and it opened up a conversation that I think was three years uh, after the event. And then I certainly encouraged her to um, call one of our grief counselors and, and see if there were some things that we could do. So I think there's a really important lesson in that, that everybody's different in how they handle grief and death. And some people need our help immediately at the moment of a loved one's last breath and in some cases i mean it is it is crisis management and if we need to get them involved in in, in intense um care we can do that but others it can take years for the grief to come up and and i think it's important for people to understand and recognize that and also feel like they can reach out at any point that they they feel their life is not fulfilled and where it needs to be because of grief. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. What a beautiful story to emphasize that grief can be very patient and people do deal with it in, in their own way and possibly deny it and hold it on and keep moving from one thing to another in the hopes that they're not going to settle in and feel it. Yes. <laughs> so 
I'm so grateful that that woman, for whatever was the trigger for her to go to to your uh, to to the brick to yes. the last play whatever the memory yes. garden. Let's use that. Yes, yes, and I too. Open up, and you just happen to be there. Yes, yes. The mysteries sometimes of end of life, and and when we can tap in and when we can offer a helping hand it, it's it's pretty profound but but certainly i think a message for your listeners is step one is asking for help and you know if people don't ask then it can be very hard for us to do and other organizations to do the great work that many many are committed to to helping people through grief and loss yeah. and in a sense the person that they loved has died and they themselves are living an unfulfilled life because they part of them has died and that they're, they're staying in that spot aren't they they're not experiencing their life to its fullness exactly and i think that's a great conversation that oftentimes people can have when they're grieving a loved one I think it's a wonderful question to ask, what would the person that we have lost want for us? And in more cases than not, the people that I have lost over my 56 years living, I am confident that they loved and cared for me enough that they would not want me to be stuck or um or living an unfulfilled life because i'm grieving over something that has been lost they they would want me to be able to move forward and i think that's a really important point yeah thank you for raising it for sure okay i can't delay any longer the, <laughs> the movie. movie yes how did health <laughs> get involved with this amazing Yes. Well, this is a very special story, too, because it, it's not just a movie. The movie Suncoast that is now out and streaming on Hulu uh, is, is a real story. And the story is about a family that Suncoast Hospice, it's one of the seven hospices that I mentioned earlier that's part of the Empath Help Network and family uh, based in St. Petersburg, Florida, the Pinellas County area near Tampa Bay. And it's a real life story about uh, writer and director Laura Chen. And going back to 2004, 2005, those were the years that the movie um, was set. Laura Chen was a young high school uh, student. And her brother, who was also a young high schooler, was dying of brain cancer. Sadly, Laura Chen's father had died when she was very young, and they were both being raised by a, a single parent. And at the same time that we were caring for the Chen family, we were also caring for Terry Shivo and the Terry Shivo family. And for listeners that that may not be familiar with the Terry Schiavo story. It's one of the most significant stories in America's history around what can happen if families don't have advanced directives and plans written down regarding who they want to give decision-making power to in the event of a, of a, of a significant um, condition. And in Terry Schiavo's case, she had a heart attack and um, oxygen flow to the brain was so significant that she was uh, diagnosed of, of basically you know, having uh, no brain capacity left, but her body was still functioning from a heartbeat perspective and things like that. So we were caring for Terry Schiavo at the same time that Laura Chen and her family were being cared for. So while the movie Suncoast is about Laura Chen and her brother Max, who ultimately died, and her mother, it was their journey of walking through end of life at the same time and in the same place and same facility that Terry Schiavo was being cared for. 
So while it is truly focused more on grief and end of life, I think what it also really highlights is some of these other important topics that we've spent some time talking about. And that is what happens when there can be a disagreement? What happens when there is controversy? And, and while that's not the focus of the, of the film, it certainly was surrounding the film. And because it was so dynamic, Laura Chen wanted to write about it, create a movie about it. And it's been very, very, very well received uh, across America and the world now as Hulu has streamed it. I watched the clip. We need to subscribe to Hulu, which is something I haven't got round to doing. We have too <laughs> many panels. Why Hulu? Why not Netflix? Anyway, um, what really struck me was the young girl was at school and wanting to fit in, and she seemed very matter of fact when she's talking to the. I, I would imagine Woody is the star of the film in the cafe that her brother was dying and she'd had a lot of death and she almost seemed matter of fact about it all. But that was her way of coping and wanting to stay, I can only imagine, focused on her schoolwork. But mom not being present because of taking care of the son, she was allowed to do her own thing. And I can only imagine that she would have felt very unloved, unwanted and unseen and all those things. That's what stood out for me. But mom is going through her own anticipatory grief. All right, I'll let you take it away. <laughs> yes, yeah. So the acting in this film is tremendous. So Woody Harrelson is playing the character of a protester because for those that will remember the Terry Schiavo story, uh, our incredible colleagues and clinical team members and, and, and all of our counselors and organization, we, we had to truly live that principle that I referred to earlier and care for the patient in the midst of very challenging circumstances because we had protesters there was a lot of legal litigation going on between the family over, you know, should she stay on life support? Should she be taken off of life support? So Woody Harrelson is playing a protester, um, protesting um, part of the family's wishes for her to be taken off of life support. So uh, Laura Chen's character in the movie uh, forges this relationship with, with Woody Harrelson. And what is very impactful in the relationship that comes out of the movie is the conversation that occurs between the two of them about how these how these decisions and how the the um, the emotions that surround these decisions are not as black and white perhaps as as Woody Harrelson, the protester, might have thought. So that was a really really neat part. The other actress that I can't help but highlight is uh is Laura Lenny she plays the mother and she does a tremendous job of i think showing how challenging it can be as a parent to have you know a, a healthy normal child whatever age in this case Laura Chen was in was high school on on top of having to care for another child you know who's facing the end of life and some of those dynamics but yes I think there's a lot in this movie around the challenges that all of our patients and families can face that we have oftentimes normal lives that we're supposed to be living simultaneous to this significant grief that's occurring. And how do you reconcile this? Because Laura Chen wanted to go to prom and wanted to have you know a dress and look pretty and have a date. Yet at the same time, she knew her brother was dying. And it's all of those conflicts that the movie really, really does a great job of bringing out. Yeah. I'm more familiar with uh, Laura's role in um, Ozark. Yes, yes. So yes. to see her playing this, this mother was, I mean, she did a great job mothering in, in, in yes. 
But anyway, I just loved her character. This, to me, is one of those movies that has so many talking points. As you raised, the need to have things in place and to have family discussions, because this is going to happen, whether they're in place or not. Having a healthy child, you're assuming that they're just going to navigate it. You're grieving and you're, you're the mom taking care. There's so many different strings just on that one alone. What stood out for you, Jonathan? Well, I do want to share Laura Linney's hope that we were able to send uh, Empath Suncoast Hospice team to the Sundance Film Festival where the film actually premiered and Laura Lenny was there to talk about the film. And her hope is that this film will spark more conversation about grief mm -hmm. and about end of life with families of all ages so that these can be um, easier. There's never an easy journey through grief, but there can be easier if we're having conversations. So I certainly want to um, to share that was one of the writer, director, and Laura Linney's um, inspirations for, for writing, producing, and releasing the film. For me personally, I think one of the most significant takeaways and experiences that I have gotten out of the film, because I've watched it now probably half a dozen times, yeah. is that the grief journey is exactly that. It is a journey. And I say this with inspiration and I say this with hope, but the deeper that we love someone and the longer that that love was a part of us, the deeper and I think the longer the grief journey and healing will be. And yeah. that's okay. And while I lost Katie um, 20 plus years ago, I will never stop grieving that loss. And that's okay. But I think not having that realization and not embracing all of the journey that I've experienced over 20 plus years, I, I truly think I would have lost something that ultimately Katie ultimately gave me. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. So it is indeed the hope that this will spark conversations. And I think it's a movie that families could potentially watch together uh, and have those conversations because families today are so complex yes. with first and second and possibly third marriages with children and navigating all yes. of the at the same time um jonathan thank you for this amazing conversation and it is my sincere wish as well that we can raise awareness on this topic because to me it can eliminate some of the hardships when you are grieving if it's spoken about it the support in place and you have amazing hospice, such as Empath Health. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for joining me today, Jonathan. Well, it's been my sincere pleasure, and, and hopefully hopefully our words have touched uh, some people today to help them along the, the way. Hopefully, too. Our next conversation is going to be around suicide. Uh, that'll be up next, but I hope this has given you some food for thought. Jonathan, if anybody wants to get hold of Empath Health, I'm sure there's a website. Yes, empathhealth.org, and that will uh, get them to many, many resources and certainly uh, ability to contact us as well. Okay, so all that is there in the show notes, listeners. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Anne. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. 
Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at anne at understandinggrief.com or you can visit my website at Understanding Grief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now.